Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be getting started in just a minute. While folks are getting logged in, I'd love to tell you about some housekeeping announcements that we have going on here. Um, you are going to be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask you to please enter it into the online Q&A box. Um, this is different than the chat feature. We are going to be using the chat feature for more discussions. So if you have a question, we recommend putting it in the Q&A box. That will enable us to keep track of your questions for the end of the session, where we'll be saving time to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the California Labor Lab and Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page. And all participants who log in today with their registration email for the full live presentation will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the evaluation form that will qualify participants for a certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. Once that evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. All right, it's my pleasure to hand it over to our moderator for today, Dr. Christina Banks. Welcome, everyone. I'm very glad that you can meet with us today, and I'm very pleased to have a talk by Jenny Weisberg. Uh, this will be our 10th webinar as by the California Labor Laboratory uh, and facilitated by the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. Uh, the California Labor Lab is a NIOC-funded center of excellence within the Total Worker Health Program. Go ahead and advance. Uh, here is our disclosure. Um, we Disclaimer, which is we are a funded program. And uh, let me tell you very simply what the mission of the California Labor Laboratory is. Uh, our mission is to extend the pursuit of health and safety for workers in traditional employment to those in a wide range of alternative arrangements and partnerships with affected communities. And I also wanted to let you know what our next webinar will be. It's uh, on Wednesday, May 24th, with Mr. Walter Stella, attorney at Cozen O'Connor, and he'll tell us everything we need to know about the existing law related to uh, employment regulation uh, to support healthy work. I also want to let you know that we do have an annual conference coming up uh, May 2nd and 3rd. It will be a virtual conference and the topic is surveillance, monitoring and data gathering in contemporary employment. Since it's virtual, you can join anytime or for the entire conference from the comfort of wherever you're sitting. Uh, registration information is available on the California Labor Lab website. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker uh, for today. Jenny Weisberg uh, leads the Families and Workers Funds grant making and government partnerships to deliver economic mobility boosting jobs. She brings more than a decade of experience strengthening workforce development and job quality. Most recently, as Associate Director of the Workforce Strategies Initiative at the Aspen Institute Economic Opportunities Program. Jenny holds an MBA from MIT, where she worked with the Institute for Work and Employment Research, and an MPA from Harvard, where she served as a policy fellow. Thank you, Jenny, for joining us today. And I'm very eager to hear talk. Great, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be with you all. And I wanted to actually start by getting a sense of who's in the room today. Um, Michelle, can you help can you help run a quick poll? If you all don't mind filling this out. Okay, looks like we have about a third of folks from the private sector, a third from government, and a third from academia, a pretty even split. Um, few folks from nonprofit and other, um, but uh, 
good to know that we have a pretty kind of even distribution from different sectors here. Um, and I actually think that's particularly exciting because this is a body of work that requires uh, collaborative work across sectors to really find better ways to define and measure and advance good jobs and workforce equity. Um, so I think uh, that will make our, our Q&A and discussion at the end especially lively to have all of your perspectives represented. Okay, so my goal for today's conversation is to share key ideas about how we can work together to define and measure and build support for good jobs. In the next few minutes, I'll give you a quick introduction to the Families and Workers Fund and our strategy. Um, and then I'll talk about why and how we define and measure good jobs. I'll then turn to our recent report on reimagining job quality measurement and lift up concrete steps that all of us in this virtual room can take to measure what matters to working people. As I talk through these ideas, I wanna encourage you all to imagine how your work might be different if we had a systematic way of measuring job quality. What if, for example, there were a simple public scorecard available to provide more transparent information about how major companies treat their frontline workers? Or what if every month when the BLS releases its influential jobs report, instead of just learning about employment and the quantity of jobs available in the economy, we learn about whether available jobs actually provide stability and dignity and economic mobility to workers. So I really want this to be as much as it can, uh, a conversation and an opportunity for learning on all sides. Um, so I'll be eager to hear your insights in the chat, in the Q&A, um, about which pieces of this work most align with your priorities and to strategize together about how we can drive action. So I'll leave plenty of time for Q&A and discussion at the end. And in the meantime, please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves or share reactions or resources. So to start a little bit about the Families and Workers Fund, we are the largest national donor collaborative working to build a more equitable economy that uplifts all. We are now a more than $65 million pooled fund and a platform for collective action supported by more than 40 leading philanthropic organizations. And we were founded in direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic on the belief that the U.S. is experiencing a once-in-a-generation opening to advance economic opportunity and mobility, especially for the workers who've been most locked out of the country's prosperity, including people of color and women and other historically underestimated communities. To effectively respond to and seize this moment, we use grant making as well as public-private partnerships to advance three primary impact areas. First, we advance good jobs that sustain and uplift workers and their families. We call this our recover up impact goal. This is my area of focus at the fund and it's where we'll spend most of our time during today's conversation. Second, we invest in building a more equitable and effective public benefit system. And third, we support partners across philanthropy to align behind shared priorities and strategies. So why work on job quality and why now? Earlier in my career, I did a lot of work with the workforce development system, and I saw that even as people were getting better educated and better prepared for work, work wasn't necessarily getting better for them. Over the past decade, there has been an increase in the rates of high school graduation and college attendance and in job training strategies that better align with industry demand. But those increases in educational attainment and skills haven't done very much to raise earnings or lead to better jobs for working people. You know, we have this narrative that work is at the core of the American dream, that if you work hard, you can build a better life for yourself and for your kids. But in reality, nearly a third of working people in this country don't earn enough to make ends meet. And that leaves 16% of kids in poverty. And people of color and women are overrepresented in the lowest paid and most precarious jobs. But the good news is we do have a rare window for change in front of us. The pandemic and the economic downturn and the racial reckoning exposed the critical need to improve the lives and livelihoods of workers. And businesses are also looking for ways to attract and retain workers because it's critical to their financial performance. 2022 was a historically tight labor market that produced nearly two job openings for every unemployed worker. And we all heard workers saying that they were looking for good jobs. There's also strong political demand here. We see it in the bipartisan support for a higher minimum wage and for better care supports like paid leave. 
And the Biden administration has really heard this call. The federal government has allocated trillions of dollars to create family sustaining jobs and fuel an equitable economic recovery. So the moment really feels right for this body of work. Together, we can help millions of working people achieve equitable economic mobility. Now, what does it look like to actually do this work? I'm gonna spend most of our time today talking about our more programmatic and public-private partnerships work. But before I go there, I thought I'd share one example of how we're supporting jobs that sustain and uplift workers through our grant making. And this will connect to our measurement recommendation on procurement that I'll talk about in a few minutes. We're proud to support the Better Builder program in Texas to partner with local governments and construction firms to advance good job standards developed for and by immigrant workers on large scale construction projects. The Texas construction industry is among the most dangerous and deadly in the country. 60% of workers report not having had any safety training and a worker dies on the job every three days. So take a minute to let that sink in. It's pretty unbelievable. The Better Builder program works with local government and with construction firms to improve these dangerous jobs. And in 2022, our support enabled Better Builder to dramatically scale its work and achieve a massive victory. Its good job standards developed by workers were adopted on Project Connect, which is a $10.3 billion infrastructure law funded project to overhaul and green Austin's public transit system. So this is gonna impact thousands of workers and their families. In 2022, we also ran a special initiative focused on defining, measuring, and building momentum in support of good jobs. We worked in close collaboration with partners across business, labor, nonprofits, and government, and the U.S. Department of Labor was an especially close and important partner in this work through a formal MOU. So in the next few minutes, I'll talk about the first two pillars of this initiative, how we define and how we measure good jobs. I'll start with how we define good jobs, because of course we can't advance job quality without a shared understanding of what we mean when we talk about a good job. We worked with the Aspen Institute and the Good Jobs Champions Group, which is a group of partners from across business, policy, labor, and workforce development to align on a broadly shared good jobs framework, which you can see here, so that we're speaking in a common and coordinated voice about our shared job quality goals. This statement was informed by a review of the many existing job quality frameworks, and it was also deeply informed by input from workers themselves about what matters to them in the job. We launched the statement publicly in November with new, nearly 250 signature, signatories on it, um, ranging from Mary Kay Henry, president of the SEIU, to Chipotle. So we were really pleased to have that cross-sector buy-in and representation. As you can see here, in brief, a good job offers, first of all, economic stability, including family sustaining pay and benefits. Second of all, economic mobility, including things like access to training and advancement. And third, equity, respect, and a voice in the workplace. We are excited that there's growing consensus about what a good job is and growing momentum to make every job a good job. But of course, we can't address what we don't measure. And when it comes to economic recoveries, for too long, we haven't measured what matters. We measure the health of our economy by counting jobs lost and jobs gained, not whether these are good and dignified jobs that provide a pathway to economic mobility. Systematically measuring job quality and breaking down those measurements by race and gender to expose disparities is the first step toward improving jobs and ensuring that our economic measurements reflect workers' real experiences and priorities. So last year, we launched the Job Quality Measurement Initiative through our formal collaboration with the Department of Labor and in close partnership with colleagues at the Ford Foundation, Irvine Foundation, Lumina Foundation, Omidyar Network, and Schmidt Futures in order to seize this window of opportunity to start measuring what really matters to working people. We brought together more than 70 leading research and data experts, and they worked in four different working groups. One focused on commercial and employer data, another focused on federal statistical data like the census, Another focused on administrative data, like unemployment insurance wage records. And then our fourth group focused on performance data. So things like the data we collect through the public workforce system. And these working groups each surfaced bold and actionable steps that leaders across government, business, the nonprofit sector, and philanthropy can take right now to strengthen our data tracking and measurement systems. In November, we released our report, Reimagining Job Quality Measurement, and I have to say that it's truly a collaborative and jointly developed product. 
It's been particularly exciting to see our group of more than 70 leading job quality and labor market experts align behind a shared set of priorities and next steps. Before I get into the meat of the report, I want to quickly name four guiding principles established by our Job Quality Measurement Initiative working group members that shape all of the recommendations in the report. The first is prioritizing equity and inclusion. The second is putting directly impacted people first. The third is ensuring privacy and consent. And the fourth is reduction of data collection and compliance burden, because better data doesn't always mean more data. Now, one of the reasons we prioritize these four guardrails is because it's really easy for outside experts to offer ideas about what to measure. But we know that the work of actually operationalizing recommendations is harder and frankly more important. So we've tried to be really mindful of feasibility and constraints as we've developed these ideas to be responsive to what the ecosystem actually needs. With that in mind, here are three questions for you to consider as I run through our big ideas. I'll come back to these during our discussion and ask you to share your thoughts in the chat. First, which of these ideas are the most compelling to you and relevant to your priorities? Which are the most actionable? What steps can we take now? And what more do you wanna learn? What experts might you wanna hear from and what additional resources would be helpful? So the report is long and it provides a lot of technical detail, um, but I wanna focus specifically on our 10 big ideas to transform job quality measurement. There are specific action steps laid out for partners and business and philanthropy and the nonprofit sector and state and local government. And I'll lift up action steps relevant to these audiences um, as we go. Uh, I'll be eager for your reactions and feedback on the ideas um, when we have time for that in the Q&A. I also want to be really clear that our role in this work at the Families and Workers Fund was to convene and coordinate and amplify the brilliant ideas of the experts that we brought together. So what I'm sharing here is sort of the top line highlights from their work, and we would be really excited to connect you directly with them if there are technical areas where you're interested in diving deeper. Okay, so big idea number one. Um, we could bring the slides back just by one. Big idea number one is to measure what matters to workers, capturing a full range of job quality indicators. Pay is fundamental, but what workers uh, say they care about um, is, is much broader than pay, right? It includes things like benefits and schedules and voice. So our North Star is to systematically capture data that reflects all of the core elements of a good job. We can imagine a time when the census regularly includes a module that focuses on capturing workers' job quality. That's that's kind of the dream outcome. Um, but since that's a longer term goal, I'll share some more concrete steps that we can take and we are taking right now. First, DOL can add questions measuring key components of job quality to federal surveys like the National Longitudinal Surveys. The experts engaged in our federal statistical working group expressed a particularly urgent need for better data on worker schedules and worker voice. So we've provided research grants to two teams of academic experts who are developing specific validated questions on these two topics that we'll be excited to release in the coming weeks. And second, philanthropy could support a national representative survey capturing worker voice that could provide a model to the federal government for the type of data that they could capture over time and how that data could be used. One idea put forward by Groundwork Collaborative through our Job Quality Measurement Initiative is a worker sentiment survey much like the consumer sentiment survey that really uh, impacts stock market and kind of how we think about um, the health of the economy. So the idea here would be to provide a regular touch point with workers to understand how they're feeling about their jobs and about the economy as a whole. Big idea number two is to center equity in measurement. To address racial and gender disparities in job quality, we need disaggregated data that exposes gaps and enables systems to actively tie strategic investments to more equitable outcomes. The federal government is already making really great progress in this area, um, but there are ways we can build on their early wins. One is to encourage or require programs implemented by state and local agencies and nonprofits to report demographic data on race and ethnicity, gender and other characteristics, and to conduct equity assessments of programs. Federal agencies like the Department of Labor that fund these programs could incentivize this kind of reporting by providing more flexible timelines, access to performance-based funds, and recognition to high performers. 
Second, in both public surveys and private surveys, we can ask workers questions about their experiences of discrimination and bias in order to increase our understanding of the relationship between these experiences and employment and health outcomes. Big idea number three is to increase mandatory human capital disclosure. In 2020, the Securities and Exchange Commission began requiring publicly traded companies to report on human capital data, which might include metrics like workforce size or pay or employee turnover. And we can strengthen that disclosure expectation by aligning government and business and investors and labor behind a common set of job quality metrics that we wanna see companies reporting along with a standardized reporting framework like the EEO-1, which companies currently use to report their diversity and equity and inclusion data to the SEC. And this would both drive greater disclosure of business data and could motivate investors to support good jobs as part of their investment strategies. In addition, the federal government could make it easier to use the data that companies are already reporting by coordinating federal agencies to use a standardized single firm identifier Private companies are already reporting a lot of data to federal agencies through business licensing procedures or OSHA reviews or small business loans, rapid response, layoff aversion, workforce training programs, right? Tax payments, even BLS data, the list goes on from there. But it's challenging and cost prohibitive to actually link all this reported data. So the recommendation here is to establish MOUs across government agencies that collect business level data to facilitate data sharing and allow for data linking to give us a fuller picture of job quality without burdening companies with additional data disclosure requests. Big idea number four is to link public and private data to gain new insights into the quality of jobs. And this builds on the last idea that I just shared about uh, using the, the data that businesses are already reporting to the federal government. So we hold many pieces of administrative and statistical job quality data in different places, but they're rarely accessible or linkable. The federal government and state and local government and commercial platforms can explore ways to better pair their data and standardize collection processes and create shared data goals in order to get better data without burdening job seekers and workers and government agencies and businesses with additional data collection requests. One area of potential focus here is enabling better linkage and use of unemployment insurance wage records. These records are a key source of administrative data on worker and firm level wages and hours, but each state manages the data collected from employers separately and according to its own standards. So a coalition of willing states could come together to develop a standardized enhanced wage record, capturing job quality elements beyond quarterly wage, including hours, job titles, start and end dates, job location, and worker demographics. Um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation JEDEX project and the Department of Labor are already making some interesting progress on this idea. Big idea number five is to leverage business data to demonstrate the return on investment from good jobs. As we emerge from the heart of the pandemic, businesses are seeking new strategies to attract and retain talent, which gives us a window of opportunity to support these employers to share and use job quality data and to spark a race to the top to improve jobs. Workforce providers and commercial platforms and other partners, including federal agencies, can provide light lift pathways and incentives for data sharing, such as offering information on marketplace or competitor trends to companies in exchange for their data. Some of the partners in our job quality measurement initiative are working to develop a simple, a simple scorecard that businesses can use to better understand their job quality performance in order to figure out ways that they can better attract and retain talent. Big idea number six is to revise our data systems to include and support the non-W2 workforce. As you all know well, our current data systems don't adequately capture the size or demographic makeup of the self-employed workforce, let alone the quality of their jobs. And these jobs are especially important to track because they're disproportionately held by workers of color and they can be particularly unstable and lack basic labor protections. The Department of Labor is making some progress through the Census Bureau's Contingent Worker Supplement, and a potential next step is to explore collaboration with Treasury to look at using tax data to track self-employed workers' economic stability and mobility. The Department of Labor could work with Treasury to create a standardized process for linking household survey data, like the current population survey and its supplements, with administrative data to combine detailed demographic information with data on employment, including earnings and hours and the nature of the employment arrangement. 
There may also be opportunity for state or local pilots that explore ways of systematically collecting earnings information on contract workers. I actually think California would be a really interesting place for a pilot. Um, and I've started a conversation with some of our leaders in the Job Quality Measurement Initiative about this idea. So would love to talk more with, with folks here if there's interest. Um, so moving to big idea number seven, um, that's to strengthen workforce system metrics to deliver results for workers and businesses. We often say that what gets measured gets done, right? And the metrics that we measure in our public workforce system don't actually tell us enough about whether the jobs that we train and refer people into are good jobs that meet the equity and economic mobility targets that I know we all care about. So I wanna spend just a couple minutes on proposed steps that federal and state and local partners can take to measure and reward job quality in the public workforce system, including by incentivizing employers to provide good jobs. So to start, we need the right metrics. We need data on the quality of jobs workers are placed into, things like benefits and scheduling practices, and whether workers are actually advancing in their careers. And we need that data to be disaggregated by demographics to ensure that the workforce system actually works for everyone, and especially for the people who've been most locked out of opportunity. And of course, it's not enough just to measure workers. We also need to measure the companies and jobs that we're sending people into to ensure that these offer pathways to mobility. So a couple of practical steps to get there. To better measure companies, the Department of Labor could release a set of model metrics for assessing and reporting firm level job quality. And the subset of state and local workforce agencies could pilot data collection with businesses that are receiving wage subsidies. A longer term goal is to revise the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act investment uh, effectiveness in serving employers metric, um, which currently focuses on the services delivered to the business to instead capture data on the characteristics of jobs created by the business, right? So for example, data could be collected through an employer survey and incentivized through wage subsidies, prioritize support from the workforce system and, and public recognition of high road businesses. Gathering better data can help us to target federal funds that subsidize employer training and hiring to employers that actually meet good job standards. And California is known to have one of the most innovative workforce systems in the country. So I think um, this is another area where there's real opportunity for the state to lead. On to number eight, we are almost to the finish line here. Um, number eight is to use public and private spending to measure and strengthen equity and good jobs. State and local governments and anchor institutions, including philanthropy and above all the federal government spend billions of dollars each year, creating and supporting millions of jobs. So if we embed job quality and equity standards into procurement and grant making, we can drive data collection and raise the floor for working people. We're hearing strong interest and momentum for this at all levels of government right now. And in fact, the federal agencies administering the bipartisan infrastructure law, which include labor and transportation and commerce and energy, have already made enormous progress and built good jobs and equity incentives into nearly $100 billion in BIL funding so far. So as these federal dollars flow down to the state and local level, uh, there's a real opportunity to work with the agencies that are applying for these funds to ensure that they have the training and the technical assistance and the tools that they need to deliver on the promise of these investments, including by collecting and evaluating good jobs and equity data. And this actually gets back to the Better Builder grantee example that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, because in that example, a worker-led campaign resulted in a local government building good jobs and equity standards into a $10.3 billion infrastructure project. So we, we need more of those kinds of examples in the field as these dollars flow. And again, you know, if procurement is something you're working on, um, I would love to talk about it. I think there are huge opportunities here. And I know once again, that California is a leader in this space. Okay, big idea number nine, strengthen state and local capacity for data-driven decision-making to advance good jobs. We recently presented to state workforce leaders from across the country about this report and how they can help implement it. And it was really clear how passionate they are about increasing access to good jobs. Um, they want better data infrastructure to know whether programs and policies are actually working, right? But as you all know, state agencies are under-resourced and they need support to strengthen their data collection and utilization skills and tools, including technical assistance and financial assist assistance and compliance flexibility. Um, so the federal government can help by providing the right support and incentives 
to strengthen data collection skills and tools and overcome silos. We need to resource and support state and local governments to strengthen and connect their data systems because they are the front lines of collecting the data that we need uh, and current support and capacity are inadequate. Federal agencies like Labor and the Office of Management and Budget and Health and Human Services can all come together to outline mechanisms to blend and braid funding from multiple federal funding streams in order to support shared data infrastructure. These agencies can also encourage or require that new investments in state or local information technology systems support interoperable systems that will make data more accessible. The end game isn't actually to burden states and localities with more with more things to collect, right? This is the point about burden and, and compliance. Um, the goal is to actually make it easier to use data that already exists in order to have more effective programs. So agencies can build cross-program data infrastructure capacity in order to reduce their compliance burden and enable better data-driven decision-making. Big idea number 10, this is our last big idea, and this is about the need to invest in all the recommendations in this report to get to action. Diverse segments of philanthropy from funders focused on equity to those focused on government effectiveness can come together with business and with government partners to support job quality measurement, including by investing in demonstration projects and data capacity building. And this is an area where the Families and Workers Fund is really focused right now um, in, in uh, collaboration with many of our funder partners. So what's next in this work? Um, I've just given you a preview of the big ideas in the report. I would really encourage you to read the full report uh, in order to get a much deeper level of technical information about action steps. Um, we released the report publicly last November at an event with um, our then Deputy Secretary of Labor, Julie Su, now our uh, sec Secretary-designate, um, along with leaders from media and policy and the White House and philanthropy, investing and academia. And it's been really great to see the traction the, the report has been getting so far. Um, we've had more than 40,000 viewers. We've had coverage in the New York Times and in DOL publications. We've had more than a dozen requests for, for briefings from partners looking to implement recommendations. Um, and the vision here was never just to kind of create a long list of recommendations that sits on a shelf. We tried to focus as much as we could on concrete and actionable ideas. And now we want to work with partners like you all to put them into practice. So I want to just name two specific paths forward that are at the top of our list as we look toward implementation. Um, first, we have several ready-to-go pilots and demonstrations that can test scalable measurement approaches, things like scorecards for state workforce agencies and employers, and new national surveys that could change the conversation about the state of our economy. And we're excited to help move these projects forward with our philanthropic partners. Second, the federal government is investing trillions of dollars in the coming years to transform the country's infrastructure, accelerate the transition to a clean energy future, and create millions of economic mobility boosting jobs. And that presents an enormous opportunity to better measure the jobs that we create in order to ensure that we're actually delivering on the promise of these investments. So we're committed to collaborating with partners at the federal and state and local level to provide that training and technical assistance and, and tools, as I mentioned earlier, that are needed to advance that goal. So if you have ideas about pilots or measurement tools and approaches that you want to use uh, to develop um, in order to raise the floor with for workers, I would really welcome the opportunity to connect and learn more about your work. And I'm Jenny at familiesandworkers.org. So let me start to move us into the Q&A section and I can go back to details on specific recommendations if there are questions around those. Um, but what questions are coming up for you all? Jenny, great information. Uh, uh, very succinct. Uh, loaded with information, loaded with uh, pathways to go forward. And uh, I would like to um, start off by uh, a question. Um, we do have, uh, let's see, we have one question um, that will come through in a minute. Okay. But let me start off with a question here, which is, you gathered all these experts from all these different domains. 
Um, and that's terrific. That's a wonderful way to build uh, consensus and also to expand your thinking on this. So is there any group that you wish you had uh, brought into the discussion that you weren't able to um, in order to uh, deepen your definition of job quality measurement? That's such a great question. Um, I think it's uh, so important to have um, all the key stakeholders that uh, will play a role in ensuring that, that jobs continue to get better at the table in these conversations so that we're all rowing in the same direction. I think what comes to mind as it relates to the measurement work, um, we had a really strong commercial and employer working group that uh, that had a lot of kind of data experts that represented large business, you know, folks from LinkedIn and Glassdoor and, and uh, MZ Burning Glass and so on. Um, but we actually didn't have um, leaders from large business in that room with us, although we did have some involved in the Good Jobs Champions definitional work. But I think... Um, particularly given what came to the surface uh, around the importance of sort of demonstrating the business case for good jobs, having more large business perspectives in the room to speak to what data do we already hold, you know, what prevents us from sharing it more widely, um, and what would really um, sort of take us over the edge in terms of motivating more disclosure um, and more public conversation about um, you know, the challenges and opportunities in uh, making job quality improvements and, and tracking how those do or don't generate bottom line impacts for firms. Right. And it, it seems uh, for the publicly traded companies, uh, there is uh, quite a lot of data that is reported, as you mentioned. You, you, you mentioned a number of different things that are reported in those contexts. Um, is there this may be a group that you would be particularly eager to engage with. And the question is, uh, how do you engage with those people successfully to convince them to, to put um, the time and effort into reporting the kind of statistics that you're interested in reporting? Another um, question is, did you involve anybody who knows a lot about change management? Um, and changing behavior, uh, influencing behavior, because that's really at the core of what you're trying to do. You're trying to get people to do something new. Is there any interest in engaging consultants or uh, uh, people who have a long history of uh, being involved in movements uh, where behavior is changed? Yeah, I love that question. Um... We, uh, you know, we didn't necessarily have change management experts at the table with us in the job quality measurement initiative, but we are frequently in contact with, you know, consultants um, and with movement leaders through the Families and Workers Funds, you know, different bodies of work um, as we're thinking about what it actually takes to um motivate employers to make changes and and you know even when the will is there about sort of the complexity of operational implementation and how to get it right so i think it's a really important audience to engage and i think um you know part of what's interesting about the the uh, advocates or movement leaders piece um that i also heard in that question is um that can help us think about not just how do we change practices within a company, but how do we change mental models and broader cultural discourse so that there's kind of widespread consensus on why this is important and a shared path forward in terms of how we do it. And, and ideally, you know, we depoliticize some of this work. And I think some of that is organically happening and the pandemic really triggered some of that thinking um, and help more people see why improving the lives and livelihoods of essential workers is uh, just critical to economic stability and resilience. Excellent. So Laura Trupin asks, given the recent ending of the pandemic relief funds with no actual improvement in the economic reality, do you think that the moment you referred to at the beginning of your talk has passed? Uh, what is the Families and Workers Fund long-term plans as we move away from this moment? 
we're we're asking you tough questions. I realize. <laughs> I mean, I sure hope the moment hasn't passed, right? I, I mean, from my perspective, the moment's just beginning because we have these new federal investments focused on infrastructure and climate moving now, and and they will be moving for the next decade. Um, and those are creating some real generational opportunities. Um, you know, they will be they are explicitly designed to create more middle class jobs, but I think there are questions about how they'll be spent and whether um, we can fulfill that promise and actually ensure that that all of the jobs that they create are family sustaining jobs and that there are equitable pathways into those jobs so that communities that have historically been locked out of construction and other kind of relevant middle class sectors uh, are actually the primary targets for these jobs, right? So um, I think that there is much opportunity still ahead of us. Uh, to the question about sort of long-term orientation, um, I should say that we at the Families and Workers Fund, we were set up as a five-year fund. Um, and we think carefully about where we can invest to make near-term impact at scale for, for working people and their families. So we do really try to be opportunistic about um, how we can do the most good right now. But I think, um, you know, we also have an orientation towards how can we make change that's sustainable that will have long-term impacts. Um, but, but my hope is that um, plenty of appetite still for change, plenty of momentum in this work. And, that, and that's what we're seeing. We all do. We all hope that. Ninika Howard asked the question, uh, small businesses have very different challenges than large businesses. She wonders if there are differences in what is feasible to measure by company size. Uh, for example, leveraging business data probably that already exists. Um, any thoughts on this? Yeah, this is another great question. Um, and I think uh, I actually did a lot of work on this um, before I came to the fund when I was at the Aspen Institute. Um, and uh, I think part of the complexity is that um, small businesses don't have the same kind of internal data infrastructure. You know, we don't, whereas large businesses, you can sort of plug an ADP system, for example, into um, a measurement tool and just extract a lot of really useful workforce data. That's much less true with small businesses. And on top of that, uh, there's all the other constraints that small businesses face around, um, you know, capacity and um, and just the ways that even when there's a ton of will to make jobs better uh, in certain sectors, margins are so tight and the day-to-day -day operations of the business is so demanding that it can be hard to really sort of carve out that dedicated time to make the improvements and to you know, to make the improvements, let alone to measure those improvements and what they're doing for the business. Um, so I think it's a really good question, but I also am seeing this done well uh, with help from certain intermediary partners. Um, for example, um, we do some collaborative work with Pacific Community Ventures, which is a community development financial institution in the Bay Area, and they focus specifically on how they can you know, do small business lending in ways that support good jobs improvements and involve good jobs measurement. And I think part of the good intentionality there is, okay, let's not let's not burden small businesses with this ask without providing some supplementary funding and technical assistance to actually support uh, additional system development. Um, but that once they've done that, there are, you know, there's there's both sort of like the worker engagement piece around focus groups and surveying that can help to get at some of the important qualitative information about what's happening, but also just some basic information that they can collect around financial performance and um, and business operations that can start to tell a story about um, the ways that job quality improvements in businesses can be good for workers and for the bottom line. Victor Rubin also asked uh, this, a very similar question, and he agrees with you. This is extremely difficult. Uh, he also notes that, uh, as you say, that this effort to bring small businesses into the fold of supporting um, high-quality jobs calls for different supports and incentives. So, you know, he he uh, is also uh, anxious to hear that question. 
Maureen Conley asks, any recommendations where to start to develop an assessment tool for the purpose of measuring quality of work for a specific industry such as tech? Yeah, great question. Um, Maureen would love to connect with you directly on this actually, um, because one of the pilots that came out of our job quality measurement initiative is um, an employer scorecard. And basically what they did, they started with that um, good jobs champions framework that I shared earlier with the, the pillars around economic stability and mobility and equity, respect and voice. And they looked at, you know, what data do companies already hold um, that they're being asked to report either to the federal government or, you know, to other um, in other ways, right? Um, and how can we start to match that existing data onto these different categories? Um, and how can we think about the right benchmarks in each of these categories so that as we're uh, doing that assessment work, we know what good looks like. Um, and they're at a stage now where they're ready to start piloting the tool in different sectors. Um, the goal is really to make it easy for companies to kind of dump the data that they already hold into this tool to understand how they're doing in relation to these benchmarks. Um, and they've done a lot of good thinking about, you know, disaggregation and how to really build equity into the tool. Um, so I would welcome the opportunity, Maureen, to connect with you on that or, or others who are on this webinar to figure out, you know, how can they pilot it in sector specific ways that um, uh, that really meet business needs and can help to create more uptake. Having a tool like that would, uh, I think, advance your initiatives greatly. Um, if, if it was easy to use, made sense, and helped the business become more productive and effective. So I'm sure you're going to get some more inquiries after this talk about uh, the, the eagerness to develop an assessment tool for you. There are a couple of technical questions here that uh, aren't as uh, wide sweeping as the questions that have been coming at you so far. Uh, one is from Paul Batcher, um, who asks, how will the family supporting pay be determined? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, there are a lot of great living wage calculators out there. Um, we tend to use the MIT living wage calculator as our, uh, as our favorite tool. Um, some of the things I really like about that one, first of all, that it that it, uh, it goes down to county level data, and I think that's really important given the um, geographic differences in um, in baseline wage needs. Um, and I also like sort of the full slate of things that it takes into account um, for families of different sizes to understand, uh, you know, what basic needs look like. So. Um, uh, you know, EPI also has a tool. Uh, I think the University of Washington may have one as well. Um, but that's the one we usually use to get to family sustaining wage for a particular place. Sounds great. Kelly Warnett Leff asked another technical question. Uh, did you have any injury data experts involved in the process of job quality improvements? That is such a good question, um, and it's been interesting how this has uh, been coming up for us actually over the last several weeks. We recently did a, a conversation with folks um, at NIOSH actually um, who had reached out to you know connect around this work, better understand it. Um, and we are hearing more and more from folks who come out of the public health side and are thinking about the social determinants of health um, about the ways that they see the importance of measuring job quality as kind of an input into health outcomes. Um, and so we really want to, um, you know, bring these conversations together uh, because clearly uh, they, they are mutually reinforcing conversations. Um, in terms of injury data experts, some of the academics in the initiative did have experience working with OSHA data and thinking about um, workplace safety. We also have some of that expertise through um, the Families and Workers Fund's grant making and just, you know, some of the uh, worker led organizations on the ground have, uh, out of necessity, found ways to kind of track and think about um, injury rates, um, but would welcome the opportunity to um, engage more injury data experts in this body of work. 
so we have, um, I just want to encourage people to ask uh, qu their questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to um, ask a question myself, um, which is how the Families and Workers Fund is perhaps uh, connecting with other groups working on the same issue. For example, the Healthy Work Campaign uh, that is led by Dr. Peter Schnall out of the University of California, Irvine. Um, and, and, and I know there are other groups involved here. It, it, is there a consortium of people working together on the same thing? Um, or another way to ask is, how is this different from what other people are trying to do? Yeah, um, so I would say, you know, collaboration is sort of at the heart of what we do with the Families and Workers Fund. And we think it's the right time in this issue space to really push for that, right? Uh, I've been working on these issues of job quality for a number of years, and I feel like at one point, uh, some of us felt like we were sort of like out in the wilderness banging on the drum. And now, uh, partly or as a result of the pandemic, partly, you know, for a number of different forces have come together, including changes in the labor market that have really activated businesses around the need to improve good jobs or improve jobs to attract and retain talent. Um, all those things have really sort of brought the conversation about the problem of bad jobs and, and all the economic and social benefits of improving jobs into the mainstream. And so it feels like the time for uh, the range of, of different groups and stakeholders that are working on these issues to come together and establish shared language, shared priorities to help advance the work. Um, and that's part of what we're trying to do at the fund. It's part of what we tried to do through the Good Jobs Champions process. And we were really excited to have uh, these different networks, right, networks in policy and in labor and uh, in the private sector sort of coming to the table and engaging in those conversations with us to get to um, to get to some consensus. Um, but I will say, I don't think I know the healthy work campaign. So that's a really good one to have on my radar. Um, and kind of would welcome the opportunity to learn, you know, from them and to learn about others that may not be in collaboration with us yet. Um, and in terms of how we're different, I think, um, in many ways, our hope is, is not to be different, right? Is to be the convener that, or a convener that can help bring these conversations together and move them forward as quickly as possible. Um, but, but practically, you know, perhaps our difference is that we're coming from the space of philanthropy uh, as a pooled fund. And so um, part of the perspective we bring comes from our activities as a grant maker. Yeah, I, it, it's hard to keep track of all these different streams working towards the same end uh, because we all want to lift up families and workers and prevent them from being injured and and uh, become sick at work and um, and not be able to support their families, not be able to have a reasonable living. And, uh, you know, it's it's uh, unfortunately a lot of it is siloed. You know, we have we have our own streams of communication, our own uh, focus, um, and it just seems that we're all working towards the same end. And it would be, um, I mean, and what you're trying to do is different from what other people are trying to do. Um, but the thing is, you're all working towards the same goal. So I would love to see uh, more of the collaboration happening. Um, because your work is so important and you've laid out um, such a great vision for it. So I'm going to ask you one more question. Uh, oh, we, I th wait a minute, I think we might have another question here. Yes. Robert Rosenthal asks, uh, you spoke of dignity as a metric, and I was curi curious if you have any examples of how to measure and address dignity in the workplace how's that for a question <laughs> to wrap to wrap up your talk <laughs> that one really pulls the heartstrings <laughs> thank you robert 
Um, so I would say we would consider dignity maybe more more a, an aspiration than a metric. Agreed that it's a hard one to measure, but some of what we think about when we talk about dignity, you know, two things that really come to mind for me: one is equity, and another is voice. Um, uh, because we see uh, we see instances, and, and again, sort of speaking from some of my past experiences, doing a lot of um, focus groups with frontline workers, you know, uh, in context when workers when, when those things are eroded for workers when they don't have access to those things, we see how it impacts their sense of well being and dignity at work. Um, as it relates to equity, you know, lots of lots of different ways to measure it, but um, again, connected to dignity, I think really important to understand workers' experience of harassment or bias on the job, um, in addition to the basic work of disaggregating every element of worker voice in order to understand how um, different communities are experiencing different elements of the workplace. Um, in uneven ways, uh, you know, based on identity. Um, and then I think voice, right? Um, workers' ability to influence uh, how their job is designed, their day-to-day -day experience at work to ensure that it works for them and they can bring their best self to work. And this is an area where we spend a lot of time um, in the Job Quality Measurement Initiative and we're able to learn from some really fantastic experts, um, at MIT and Cornell and elsewhere. Um, and, and one of the things I found really interesting about those conversations is that I think often in the job quality space, when we talk about measuring worker voice, we measure um, are workers represented by a union or do they have access to employee ownership? And those are both like interesting proxies for voice. Uh, obviously, you know, there's lots of good cases for, for why those things um, can help raise the floor for workers, uh, but they also really don't capture um, many of the workers in our economy because union density is now so low and because employee ownership opportunities are still fairly limited in the economy, especially for frontline workers. And so we need more and better ways of capturing, of capturing worker voice. And one of the ideas that our experts brought that I found really compelling was this idea of how do we measure voice e uh, efficacy, meaning how do we measure whether workers' experience of using their voice actually influences other elements of job quality? So, for example, you know, a worker saying that if they speak up, um, their wage actually does improve or their benefits do get more accessible or more robust. Um, so I think that metric around um, whether, whether workers' experience of using their voice actually leads to different outcomes at work uh, is one that we could do a far better job of measuring in federal statistical data and in, you know, our, our kind of private survey data on worker experience. That's a great answer. If we could just measure what we need to measure to really understand how people work and its impact on them and be able to improve the areas that uh, take away from their life satisfaction and their health and well-being and enhance the things that build their health and well-being, um, we would be a lot better off. And so the actions that you're taking, the pathways that you've laid out and the action steps, you know, bring us closer to being able to do that. So we really appreciate the time you've taken to talk to us about uh, your project. And uh, we invite everyone on this call and elsewhere to uh, help help this along. So thank you so much, Jenny, for your time. And thank you, audience, for participating in this great webinar. Thank you all so much for having me um, and really appreciate the insightful questions and look forward to hopefully connecting with many of you in the future. Thank you.